Daily News. I have uh, been uh, the guy in Portland. I'm the guy um, who covers Southern Maine for the Bangor Daily News. And it's been a great gig. Um, and I've been a photojournalist uh, for a little over 20 years, I guess. And I've spent all my entire career here in Maine. I used to work for the Times Record, which was a, it's a little newspaper in the Midcoast. And uh, that was where I got my start. Uh, I did intern a little bit at the Sun Journal when I got out of college. Now, I didn't go to college till I was in my mid to late 20s. So I had a lot of jobs before I got this photojournalism gig. And this is by far the best job I ever had. In fact, it's, the, it's my dream job. It's really the only vocation I've ever uh, really felt like I wanted to do. And uh, I like talking about it. Uh, and I'm a, I've been asked pretty much since day one to talk to uh, uh, students at uh, high schools and even junior highs and elementary schools. So I've given this just this sort of talk a little bit, uh, more than once, but it's been um, it's a uh, it's it's evolved over the years, and uh, I'd never get tired of uh, talking about uh, photojournalism and and how it works um, because. Um, I find it interesting and it's, it's never not interesting. I never know exactly what's gonna happen next and I love that. And there's no set hours, <laughs> which I also like. So uh, is this the part where I turn on my, sh I share the screen and we start the, the slideshow? I think so. Uh, and yeah, you, you have your, uh, your, normally when I do this, I do it in a room full of live people and people shout questions at me. Um, uh, halfway through and we have a nice conversation, but that's not really possible with this whole uh, Zoom thing, which is a little weird because I'm just going to talk to myself and I'm seeing some of your faces now, but in a second, I'm going to switch over to my pictures and, and Linda's pictures um, and I won't see you anymore. I'll only see myself and that will be incredibly strange. So I hope Alyssa will chime in and tell me if I'm doing okay or not. <laughs> and fit, you can pose questions anywhere during this if you want. Alyssa. So let's see if I can uh, get this uh, turned over uh, to the share screen, as they say. So there's the, there's the thing. And uh, I got to, that's what everybody does, right? Ah, there we go. So can everybody see that? Nod your head if you can see that. Or somebody tell me if you can't. Um, I minimize that. So this is this talk is how to take pictures like a photojournalist by Troy R. Bennett. That's me. And Linda Cohn Kresic, who is my uh, in ooh, there's Linda. Hey, Linda. And uh, just getting going. And uh, I should I go back if Linda's here? Um, maybe I should uh, go find it. Maybe, maybe Linda introduce herself. Let's uh, I think she's still just connecting to audio. Linda, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yay. I'm so sorry. I couldn't okay. get in there. <laughs> All right. Hey. <laughs> so have, have I stopped? Oh, I've stopped sharing my screen. Where's Linda? Linda wave. Linda. Hi. <laughs> I am here. So I just, I gave them my basic bio um, and uh, you give them your basic bio. How long have you been doing this? And um, how'd you get started? And why do you love photography so much? Yeah, so I have been shooting, um, I graduated from college in 1995 and started working for newspapers at that time. And I have worked at uh, five papers now. Um, and actually I just got into it. I was in art photography before and it was just a little too slow for me. I need, I need a little bit faster pace. And so I thought I'll try photojournalism and wow, loved it. Um, loved meeting new people, uh, new adventures, something new every day. Um, it's just, that's, that's the joy of the job. It's, I love photography, but it's more about the experiences with it for me. Yeah, totally. I totally agree with that because <clears throat> there's other kinds of photography that I think on paper I might be qualified to do, but I don't think I could because this is the only kind of photography that I'm not, I'm not getting paid to make somebody look really nice in pictures. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Not necessarily. <laughs> We're here to tell stories. So I'll go back to my, I'm going to share this screen. And Linda, you keep your audio on and I'm going to have you chime in. Okay. A yep. lot, a lot here because they don't want to just hear me talk. <laughs> um, 
I, I doubt. Okay, so how to take pictures like a photojournalist. Now, this is not a talk about um, how, how your camera works or how, what the bells and the whistles do and all the buttons because I have no idea how your camera works. The only reason I know how my camera works is because I use it a lot and I read the book. And you could do that too. But um, what, what photography is, I think, uh, to me, is that um, it's like the great democratic art form or communication form. Anybody can learn to use a camera. It, it, it's really just a set of steps and, and technical jargon and knowledge. And anybody can do that and then start getting into to making pictures. The hard part is, to, is, is, the, is uh, doing it. Um, I don't have any, in, I don't, I don't, maybe Linda does, but I don't have any innate knack for this. I, I worked really hard to get good at it. And I practiced a lot, just like if I wanted to become a good ping pong player or writer <laughs> or anything, you know what I mean? I just did it a lot and I was self-critical and I, I learned to get better. And that's what I think the, the amazing thing about photography is that anybody can do that. And that's why we're here, um, uh, right now at this little zoom meeting. Um, so uh, you don't have to work for a newspaper to shoot like a professional storyteller. All you need to do is think like one and then practice. So you, and the, the kind of pictures we make are, are visual sentences. They, they tell a story. And anybody can apply the principles of this photojournalistic storytelling to make your own photos um, better, I think. Um, I always think pictures mean more when they have something to say. And uh, like that photo there, I think, I don't know, something's going on there. And so, yeah, and it's an interesting part, Troy, too, yeah. about the storytelling. Um, we spend a lot of time looking through the camera without ever hitting the shutter. Yeah. And you're waiting. You're waiting for some perfect moment, like you're just watching this guy or whatever. And you're just really waiting for that one special moment that, that captures more than the first time you saw the person. Right, right. And that's, that's all in your, in your brain, in your eyeball. And uh, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with what camera you're using or any of that technical stuff, I don't think. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I, I usually, I, I show pictures at the beginning of my talks and I ask people like, what's going on here? Uh, because I feel like you can create a little narrative from, <clears throat> from some of these photographs. I can't hear anybody else, but Linda, what's going on in this photo? Well, it looks to me like they're coming home. How, how can you tell they're coming home? Oh, I wonder. They just look so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can you can see the bus like they're coming off the bus rather yeah. than getting on it. Um, there's like a moment. Um, well, it doesn't look like that when they leave. It's much sadder when they go. <laughs> there you go. See, yeah, you know. Uh huh. You've done this before. Uh, now, Linda took this one, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna guess what's going on here. Uh, it's, it's kind of, I like this photo a lot because of that lady's face, for one thing. I mean, that face is a whole book in and of itself. And, and obviously, uh, she's inside trapped, and there's somebody outside who's, it's cold. They're, they're bundled up. And down on the windowsill, there, there you can see the styrofoam cup with, uh, with a straw that, to me, says hospital or nursing home and a little doll. And it looks like maybe a box of tea on, on the corner there. I can't really tell. Um, but it has a real melancholy feel to it. What was this, Linda? Yes, this was uh, the Tall Pines Nursing Home during COVID when they, yes, they were having a, a lot of hard times there. And that mm -hmm. lady, that was her daughter visiting her at the window. Mm -hmm. This one here, usually when I bring this up, everybody in the room goes, oh. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> You did, yeah. See, maybe people did that. I took this years and years ago. Uh, um, and <laughs> it looks sad, uh, and some some photos will really create something emotional in you very fast. And I think this one does. It's animal control, and there's a sad looking beagle. Turns out, I always tell people that he was actually being taken to a prospective home when I caught that picture. He was being transported to a foster home where they might have adopted him. I don't know what happened, but it's not maybe as sad as it looks. <laughs> And the, I, th I took this photo and uh, uh, I don't know, Linda, uh, sometimes uh, you just got to keep your eye in the camera, right? And, and yes, I, exactly. I don't know, and something magic will, will happen if you just wait. It's, I think Robert Deneau, like the famous French photographer, he said something about um, uh, the li life is just, uh, it's like a stage and you just have to wait for the curtain to go up. 
That's true. But the other thing about this photo is a lot of times you have to be watching beyond what is right in front of your face. Like the game is in front of your face and that's what we're there to shoot. But you look beyond that to see what's happening on the sidelines or in the stands. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, let me see. Go to the next one. I, this is one of Linda's best photos of last year, I think. Um, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that just, that, that, uh, that just says, so much that's the pandemic right there you can tell he's in he's in school he's raising his hand he's still in class this must have been at the beginning but you can see he's got his mask on and you can see all those empty seats and she's kept some of them in focus where it says seat to remain vacant for COVID-19 distancing it's like holy cow it feels so empty and so so apropos of last year I mean I think that this I don't know I think it sums up the whole, the whole thing Bravo, Linda. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, cu a couple more of these. There's an, I, I don't know, I got some sad animal photos in here. Um, what's going on here? What do you think is going on here, Linda? Well, to me, I'm thinking you're at the fair, and oh. this girl was showing her cow, and now it's going away. That's exactly it, yeah. 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 She, she spent she a lot of his... I don't remember what her name was, but I remember the cow's name was Pedro. And uh, she she had raised Pedro and lovingly cut him, you know, cut his hair and brushed him and shampooed him. And she brought him to the 4-H show to get a good price for him. And then she was saying goodbye. Wow. And the other thing I would say about this photo, which it not necessarily may be applicable to people taking family photos, is that I shot that from a distance. And in order to run it in the newspaper, I really got to find out what her name was. Um, and I went over and talked to her and she was still crying and I told her what I was doing and she, she was not hesitant about telling me her name at all. She was totally fine with it. And she, and she told me she does this every year, <laughs> which seems like a horrible thing to do to yourself. But, but I bet she has this picture in her room. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I did. I definitely, I got I took her email address and, or her mom, I, I talked to her mom for a second. Her, I got her mom's email address and I sent it, sent it to them. Nice. Yeah. Which I do all the time. So yep. any, so anyway, like what is photojournalism? This is, I, I wrote this, this is maybe not exactly what Linda would say, but I say it's the mystical art of telling stories with pictures. And it, and it started with like cave paintings or maybe like somebody drawing something in the dirt and it evolved all the way uh, to you and your, your camera. It could be you and your DSLR or you and your phone camera. And it's not just pretty pictures, things that, that are that are gorgeous looking. It's about images that have something to say, that have a, a little a little narrative to them, like we were just discussing. And they say it clearly, they have drama or emotion or narrative. And what Linda was saying was earlier was the decisive moment. You're just waiting for some element of it to come together, and you snap on that one. Um, and what what we do as photojournalists at the newspaper, on top of all that, is we try to make our pictures like incredibly clear not ambiguous like you might do with art you know art sometimes mm -hmm. you, you take a picture or paint something to, to raise a question or to make you start thinking i want you to know what's happening is that does that sound about right linda yes definitely yeah, yeah. you're you're right all right uh, that's the picture i took at a skate park and i just thought it's a decisive moment because he i he, he got the sun in his hand there which i like yeah i love that <laughs> that was totally by accident <laughs> yeah, <say> that. <laughs> yeah that was by accident so how do you get good at it? Well, step one, and I tell this to everybody, is you have to care. You must care. You, you can't get good at this, or you can't make better pictures of any kind if you don't, if you don't give a darn. <laughs> you must care about getting good at it. You have to practice to get good at anything, and uh, you have to practice to be good at this. Uh, and since I started shooting digital, I have gotten to be a better photographer, definitely, um, mm -hmm. because pixels are free. I never have yeah. to think about it. Have I taken too many photos or how many roll shots do I have left? So, and I think that that at first I thought it was wasteful, but I think it's, it's just better practice. Shoot, 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 shoot all the time. But then also afterwards, look at your pictures and be critical about them and think about what you can do the next time. I think the French, I'm going to quote another French photojournalist, Henri Cartier-Bresson, he said something about, you should think about photography all the time, except when you're taking pictures. <laughs> right you should just you should know everything already and then react and just, be, yeah. just be taking pictures anyway. um uh and so here's like some principles uh, of how i think linda and i do this um is that we nab the action we kidnap the action as it unfolds we 
you don't wait. Uh, shoot now and keep shooting till it's over and then shoot some more because something will happen after they think you're done shooting. Don't mm -hmm. be cautious. You have to keep your eye inside the camera hole, whatever the viewfinder, that's what you call that, <laughs> the camera <laughs> hole. <laughs> and you keep your finger on the button. Don't look, don't pull your camera down because the second I pull my camera down, that's when something happens. And then if I see it happen, it's too late. I, it, it happened seconds ago by the time I get my camera back up to my face. Right. Um, and get closer, uh, get higher, get lower, backpedal in front of somebody walking away from you. I always say if Robert Kappa, he shot photos during the D-Day landing in France. That means you and I have no excuse for not getting closer to the action. I, I put this photo up there just because there were two guys arguing at a protest last year. And I got real close and um, neither one even noticed I was there because they were too busy arguing with each other. I suppose it- Yeah, that was great. That's a great picture right there. Oh, thanks. And you're right up in their face. Yeah, I had a, that was as wide as it would go, I think. It was a 28 millimeter, I think. I, and I, I say that, and I don't want to discount the fact that I'm six foot two and I weigh 250 pounds. So I'm, I don't feel threatened by, by most people, but anyway. Uh, and so uh, a big thing I tell people is you have to approach everything you're shooting, whether it's a family get together or, or a family wedding or Christmas or anything you're going to do as if you're shooting a movie um, to get to get everything shoot wide, a big wide picture, a medium uh, and a close up every single time you photograph anything. Um, and um, wide is an overall sort of a panoramic shot to set the scene to show people where you are. And uh, but you don't have to be boring about it. You can go up a flight of stairs or stand on a chair or uh, I've gone up in buildings to look out a window, just randomly knocking on doors to see if I can get let into somebody's apartment or office so I can get a shot out the window if something is happening. And a medium shot is usually where there's uh, two people uh, react, uh, interacting with each other. They're doing something. They're um, they're shaking hands or they're smiling or they're cooking together or it's the person and the job that they're doing. It's them and their shovel or them and the watch they're fixing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think faces are really important in all and those sorts of shots. Like faces are absolutely everything. And a right. close up is 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 like um, it's something closer than you would normally look at something. It's so close that it reveals something you may not have noticed before. It's the old lady's hands as she plays the piano. It's the chewed pencil stub on the desk after a big exam or a set of tools on a workbench. Does all that make sense to you, Linda? Oh, it definitely does. That's, yep, that's how I go into every assignment, too. I, I can tell because I looked through the archive today and looked at your assignments, <laughs> and I can see you and I do the same thing. That in the old days of just newspaper papers, um, they wouldn't run all of those usually. You'd, they'd probably pick the medium one. Um, but now, uh, online, uh, we can have three photos with a, with a story, no problem. So it, we really, and you don't have any space constraints either shooting your own photos you can shoot uh, uh, all of these and more i think and you and your viewers will get a better sense of what was going on there that day so here's some examples of what i mean about that so this is a very simple photo assignment i did it's not a great drama or great newsworthiness but it was a it was a story about sleigh rides somewhere a very beautiful and so yeah like well thank you <laughs> here's <laughs> like the I didn't know this. I was on the sleigh and I walked back into the field and I turned around to get a wide shot. And then I saw the mountains. I didn't even know they were there. Um, so that shows you, you know, it's uh, this forest, there's mountains, it's winter. Um, there's a red sleigh, that kind of thing. Shows you where you are. You know, you're not in the city. It's not a, it's not a ride through the park. This is another one. It's not as good, I think, but another sort of wide one. And then here's like the medium shots, right? So there's the lady driving, it's her incredibly photogenic dog, and there's a passenger who's smiling. Uh, not great drama, but uh, it, shows, um, it, it shows the people closer up. This is a little better, except the people aren't really sharp, but you know, the dog's looking around the corner. It's like a little moment. Um, you know, there's a kid, there's a kid there. Um, this too, kind of a thing. And then um, and this is like my close up on this one. I just looked down and saw the horse's legs and the little apparatus there in the snow. And then as sort of as a, as a bonus, I threw in this sort of technical mumbo jumbo one to show. Oh, yes, that's nice. That's fun. Little, little movement. I can tell people how to do that if you if you want at the end. It's not that hard. <laughs> 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 and uh, I did the same thing here. Here's like a there's a pokey fisherman coming into Portland uh, here. It sort of shows you it's a boat. It shows you um, he's got barrels. There's hooks coming down. He's about to do something. 
this is kind of overhead. I, I shot, I didn't, I held my, I was up on the dock, but I also held the camera out over him. I wasn't even looking through the viewfinder. I was just sort of snapping to see if I could get that downward shot um, to show how many fish there are. And this is like the interaction photo. He's talking to the guys in the dock. You can't see them, but they're sort of implied. And then the close up mm -hmm. of, of, I think, beautiful fish. And another little close up of the disgusting um, fish getting eaten. Um, another one here. This, this one's by Linda. This, where, where's this, Linda? To me, it looks like a Christmas tree farm. Is that right? Oh, you betcha. Yep. <laughs> On the way to Dover. And uh, so I like this one. It seems like you can tell immediately it's a Christmas tree farm. Um, and it's just a beautiful pattern of, uh, on top of everything else and the, the great trees sticking up at the top there. And then here's your, this is a great news photo right here. This is the kind of photo that in the, I'd say the old days, when we just had the newspaper in print, this is the one that would run because it shows you where you are. It's two people, they're interacting. It's a cool old Jeep. This, this has all those things all together in, in one, one medium shot, which I, I like yeah. a lot. Uh, and, uh, and here's your close up. I like this a lot, Linda, because I don't know, you can tell that it's a, it's a lady. She's got a, a big, uh, a ring on. And to me, that machine looks old. I don't know if it is, but it, to me, it seems like they've been doing this a long time. Right. It, it looks like an old wrapping machine. She's making wreaths, right? Yes, she is. Yeah. Love it. And I mean, this is, come on, <laughs> this is it. This is what a great photo that is. <laughs> She's, the matriarch she, of the business yeah oh so yeah yeah i could totally yep. see that like she's yep. she's been running this place for a while she knows exactly where all her ribbons are she knows where the colors are she's done she made a hundred of these centerpieces she's got her, her method down and uh you've got her right as she's about to put it on it's uh, it's nice it's nice we do these sorts of things all the time it, we don't necessarily do um you know fire and mayhem yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that kind of thing uh, and another thing I like to tell people is, uh, like, try not to shoot pictures you've seen before. Um, uh, this happened to me maybe like on year three of my career, where I put my camera up to my eye to take some, take a picture, and I thought, I have taken this photo before, and um, I don't want to do it again. I don't want to repeat myself. And I'm maybe taking this photo because I saw somebody else take this photo. Like that's what I'm supposed to do on this assignment. So if you're going to take a picture of your family or something, you don't have to line them up like it's school picture day, like they're going to get shot at dawn on the, on the side of a wall. <laughs> and I always tell young photojournalists, you cannot take a picture of someone sitting at their desk unless they're famous for hand carving desks. Because even if they say, well, this is where I normally work, I don't care. Just don't, don't do that because it says almost nothing, unless they have some sort of crazy, messy desk maybe. But, and you don't need to make formal wedding photos. They've hired somebody to do that. And nobody in the history of weddings has ever looked back at their formal wedding photos. That's not the one they have framed, I don't think. There's some beautiful photo of the reception of their mom and dad dancing or, uh, I don't know, something like that. There's something happening. There's a, there's a, life is a party out there. And you don't even have to shoot portraits at all if you don't have to. Um, because um, action and stories uh, um, in the photos are going to speak louder than those other kind of photos. Well, again, so, the straightforward portraits like you're talking about, there's no moment at all that happens. Yeah. They're just standing there and they're awkward and they don't want to just look at you and smile. That That's harder for the subject as well. It, totally. As the, that's a great point. Great point. Great point. This fellow here, I think I had taken his photo with that he made some mead or cider or something there in his house. I think I photographed him normally just sort of standing in there with a bottle or something. And then we got talking for a second and he says, yeah, look how clear that got. And he held it up and I shot another picture and I thought it looks better because he's got his eyes on it. He's got that light behind it, which I really like. Anyway, so uh, yeah, shoot the action. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be a news event. <laughs> it can be anything going on at your house. And uh and those are the kind of photos I'm convinced that your family will cherish maybe after you're, you're gone. And learn to use your camera. Read the manual. That's the only way I learned to use my camera is I took a class and I read the manual and, I under, and, I, and then I held it in my hand and went over it and it took me a few weeks and I finally got it. I learned how to, how to, how to control things like the aperture and the shutter speed and off camera flash and set a white balance. And, and none of that stuff is terribly hard. You can do it. Um, and once you have control over your, your camera and you know what those things do, they're like the nouns and the verbs and the adjectives of, uh, 
photojournalism, right? And you can use them to write a good visual sentence. So it's, it's, and it's the same thing with your phone too. I was telling Alyssa earlier that my phone is actually a much better digital camera than the first digital camera I own. That's for sure. <laughs> it's got lots of, um, um, I keep saying bells and whistles, but lots of controls on it. And you can even do it with that. Um, and I have learned, I don't know about you, Linda, but I have learned most of what I have learned new about photography in the past 10 years by watching YouTube tutorials. Yeah, that's There's, true. <laughs> yeah, so many definitely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Talking to other photographers. Like this photo on the, on the right there. I took that and I've got stars and a lit up canoe. And you can learn to do that too. That one is not hard. Um, it's just, I put the camera on a tripod to get the exposure for the long exposure for the stars. And I've shown a flashlight on the canoe. That's all. Mm -hmm. And I just did that by giving it a shot. Um, it looks great. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> this is so <laughs> weird just talking to you. Instead of like, oh, Troy, you're <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're awesome, Linda. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and ah, geez, this is really important in journalism. It's like, don't set things up don't tell someone to just do that again for me. If you didn't get it, you didn't get it. You just follow them until they do something else. And don't lie with Photoshop either. Don't, don't change the content. These pictures always look set up and therefore they're lame. And um, it's the same with, with home photos of your family or a sporting event or anything you do is it's better. I, can, it's, I guess it's the main point we're making the whole time is just watch what's happening. Like stay out of it and something amazing will happen. I didn't tell you these kids. Troy, yeah, I, I did. I shot this years ago at Mount Ararat um, High School. Yeah, that's great. Never seen that before to graduation. Yeah, it was it was the little they were getting a pep talk before the graduation, before they marched out. Oh, that's great. And I, I just happened to be. Well, you know, as I remember, actually, I had a feeling they might do that. They were holding hands and. Mm -hmm. they well, really, there you go. Following your intuition and waiting to see if that happens. Yeah, so I thought they might do that, or something like that, or or, something, or a hug or something. But yeah, I guess yeah. it did happen. I covered the Mount Ararat when I worked for the Times Record. I covered that graduation every year for like seven or eight years. So I got to know it really well. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, don't lie. Don't set things up. Don't have people do it. Just do that again. Or don't tell people to hold it. Because, <laughs> boy, nothing looks more awkward than that. And be, be brave. Photojournalism, as Linda could tell you, is no place for cowards. Um, you need to be bold and decisive. And because I think about writing, which I do a fair amount of at the, at the uh, Bangor Daily News as well, R writing is about thinking after the fact. You're reconstructing and explaining and you think, sit in front of your computer and you think about how am I going to write this and rewrite it and revise it. But photojournalism, and this is why I like photojournalism better than writing, is the complete opposite. You have to be prepared to get the shot that tells the story in the instant. You either get it or you don't. And no amount of Photoshop massaging will take a bad picture and make it good. You cannot polish a turd, as a wise man once told me. <laughs> you got to just get in there and shoot. And I, I just, I love that, that it's so reactive. And, and you can shoot the same way. Um, it doesn't have to be a news event like this. But, you know, another thing, I just got up close and I got this guy's, um, the protesters had taken over his meeting and he was picking up his papers and leaving. Um, yeah. And it's the same, like you, you've, you've got uncles and aunts and uncles who say, oh, don't take my picture. Don't listen to them, just do it. But don't do it, don't have them wait and stop and take a picture. Take a picture of them while they're barbecuing or cooking or, or playing softball after, or volleyball at the family get together, something like that. Is that, is that, right? Is that right, Linda? I agree 100%. Yeah, because those got... people that hate getting their photo taken, I mean, I don't blame them. It's no fun to sit there and have somebody take your picture, but. right. If you're doing something when you're in the midst of doing something you don't and you're capturing some genuine moments and yeah, yeah it's just unfolding before you it's fun and then they will like it later when they you will. show them the awesome picture you took of them or they they'll will. hate it but they'll love it and you'll have it forever <laughs> <laughs> right um uh so the last part i want to do is just to show you sort of some of the categories of of pictures that we make as photojournalists that you can also think about um, making in your own life because you can make pictures of anything. And these are the sort of photos that, that, that we make um, here. And I told you over and over again, don't shoot portraits, but we still shoot a ton of portraits. You, it just comes up because people are being, having a story written about them for something they already did or um, something they're not doing at the moment. 
so but we call them environmental portraits in that it's not just them like on school picture day with the blue background it's a picture of someone in their natural habitat um, they're usually looking at the camera this guy isn't but they're usually looking at the camera they're aware of the camera they're sort of looking at you as the viewer and but hopefully you've got them put in some sort of surrounding that will give you a hint as to why it is you took the, the photo um, I always thought this guy looked like Gordon Lightfoot, um, but he's obviously a guy who cooks lobsters. And that's <laughs> all. <about it. laughs> but we do a tons and tons of these, even though maybe it's not our favorite thing to do. Hmm. Um, here's a great one by Linda. I mean, look at all, you can get so much wow. from this. Uh, you took this this year. Tell us about this one. Yeah, I love this little guy. World War II veteran. Um, man, what a happy guy. And I... So taking his picture, I was getting his things because I really wanted to show the medals and his late wife. And he kept telling stories about her. her. Um, and he was telling all these fabulous stories from his military years. Um, tack sharp guy. And I set him on his bench outside because this also was COVID time. And uh, this was just last year. So we didn't want to be in his home with him. And um he got to telling me a story and I, I was, I had taken some just plain portraits of him. Well, he always made, he'd make himself laugh, just telling fun stories. And <laughs> I just, that was, that was it for me. Cause it completely captured this little guy's personality. 100%. He was just delightful and, and he had everything there, but it was just one little moment. And I love that one. Yeah. It's a really, it's, Great, I think it's a great illustration of how even in a portrait, you know, there's a decisive moment. That's the best time to make the picture. I think something too, Jory, when we're taking portraits is um, because it would feel really rude if you're doing that to somebody. If, if you're having a conversation with somebody and then you look to go do something else, you think it's really rude and, and it might be. But when I see something happen and we're in the middle of a conversation, I'll just pick up my camera and take their picture because <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I want to see. I don't want to wait and then i'll be like man why didn't i shoot him while he was giggling right. or something right you're trying to have a genuine interaction with somebody like you do care yeah. and you're talking to him but at the same time there's another little bit of your brain that's reserved for your the photographer thinking mm -hmm. when is that, when am i going to make the picture yeah totally totally love it um there's another one you made now i don't know what this story was but as a viewer when i look at it um, i just was just going back through some of your photos recently i like uh the He's green. He looks like an outdoorsy guy with that wool coat on. You've placed yeah. him in the trees for some reason. Um, <laughs> and why? why? Why was he in the trees? Yeah. This whole story was an interesting one to try to uh, photograph. It was about um, carbon footprint and the selling, like um, getting paid for the usage of trees to the more trees you have, the um, more money that you could be paid for offsetting carbon footprints. So it was yeah. a very um, obscure thing. I also just shot some trees like laying on the ground, looking up at some different yeah. views of trees. But this this guy was the lead uh, storyteller in, in the written part of the story. So yes, I took him right out into the forest. That's great. Nice. And it's just technically, it's, it's really nice too. It's great light and, and great Great, great lens selection, though. Although I think I shot all my portraits with that long lens during COVID because we couldn't get yes. anybody. <laughs> yes. It's nice that he's not wearing a mask, at least. Here's one I shot a long time ago of a guy. Uh, I shot this for the, the Times record. Um, so it was a, maybe nice. 15 or 20, 20 years ago. Um, uh, he was a guy who had a big uh, iron boat in his yard um, that he'd been trying to build for like 30 years. And a lot of junk and his neighbors were mad at him that's what i can remember about the story i also remember that he was really delightful and i thought how can anybody be mad at this guy <laughs> did you light his face i do yeah very good question i do have i have three lights in this photo uh, there's a light on his face coming from camera from viewer sort of uh, camera right and it's also can you see my cursor in this no. Well, there's also a, a light uh, shining up on the boat from up in the uh -huh. left hand corner. And there's another one from in the background on the right, just because the lighting was so crazy there. It was all dappled and I couldn't I couldn't get it all in the same exposure unless I um, unless I lit up um, the yeah. those bits to, to, to match the sun. I just happened. I back then I used to carry three flashes around with me, but I don't anymore. <laughs> I only have one now. This works great. This works great. Um, a portrait 
shot wide. I, for me, a, there has to be a purpose to shoot a portrait wide because I don't typically like a wide mm -hmm. portrait. There has to be yeah. a reason for it, and this one's perfect. Oh. Yeah, that's a There's good point. There's a lot of information in it. It's not distorted. You know, a lot of times people get to shoot right. wide and, and things get distorted and it's not flattering to the person. Yeah, technically, if I had gotten up close to his face, his nose would have looked bulbous and stuff like mm -hmm. that with a big wide lens. Yeah, it works, I guess, because mm -hmm. I'm back. The only thing I don't like about this is I cut his feet off too too low. No, I I, to... well, I don't know. I don't mind that at all. We know he's got feet. <laughs> 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 Whatever. <laughs> well, you're very kind. Uh, and so the other kind is we call I call this the storytelling photo, the news photo. The, 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 this is the this is what I live for, is that to have something just go on in front of me that I can watch and snap photos of. This is this is this is why I do this, I guess. Um, I don't set things up. It's just life's rich pageant unfolding naturally. And I get to capture it. Um, and if you're shooting your family, you can take pictures while people, I keep saying this barbecue or work on their cars or around bonfire or while your Nana knits or a while the, there's a construction project going on, anything like that. This happens to be a drag queen crowning, but um, I think it's got some moments going on there that the queen is, is, um, is surprised, but also the, the, the loser. Yeah, the loser on the left looks happy. The losers on the right don't look quite so happy. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. show that show was a blast to photograph they were very nice uh to me um this is a guy i know in portland who he hearts pigeons and i did not tell him to wear that shirt he wears that <laughs> just about every day he's the pigeon man he has poems he reads poems to the pigeons he knows some of them by name and by sight and they all they all love him and uh, i i knew he showed up at the park at a certain time of the day so i went and waited for him and uh, gotten to know him. He's actually a friend of yeah. mine now. And uh, this is an old one I shot years ago with a long lens. It's just stuff happening. And it was like a library event where they had a frisbee spinning expert there to show kids how to spin frisbees. <laughs> I just, just would never get tired of shooting that kind of assignment. And yeah. this could be this could be your own kid, right? You, doing stuff like that. Um, this is one by you, Linda. Um, I like this because it's something you don't see every day. Um, <laughs> Uh, it seems really um, out of the ordinary, like you're letting us in on something that, that not a lot of people get to see happen. What were they doing here? Well, they're not grave robbers. <laughs> they, are, <laughs> they actually um, fix gravestones. That is their business. Uh, they go in, people hire them to uh, fix their family's gravestone or crack will fix the cracks or when they're all tipping over and you can see them tipping and they're sinking and they pull them back up and reset them. And it was nice. really pretty neat. And they clean them really nice. Cool. And you didn't take their picture just standing in front of a straightened gravestone. You were there, you waited for this gravestone to just get at the right moment of being pulled out. So it takes, it takes some time. I covered a lot of protests last summer. Um, which involved a lot of running around the city, um, very long, hot marches. Um, and um, it was all very intense. And um, exact, it's exactly why I got into photojournalism, is to, to cover something that felt momentous like that. And uh, this is a little less mo momentous, but I thought it's a moment. I feel like th these guys let me hang out while they were refurbishing this fishing boat project. And I like this photo because um, there's a moment like they're trying to get a bolt undone, uh, but they're working together, which is what the story was about. And you can see that they're on a boat and you can also see that they're on a pier and there's lobster traps in the background and, and there's drill bits in the front and another wrench and a bucket of paint. I like all that detail. I Love think the detail. thing too, Troy, is that I don't know where people are at who are in this right now, but these photos that we're looking through, there's always a focal point. There might be all this information around it, uh, that you take in after, you know, your eye goes directly to where you want to go first, to what you want them to see. But then there's all this, the extra information that you were talking about around it. And I think that's the key too, is that you have to have your focal point so people know where to look right away. Sometimes, um, like in the beginning when I started shooting, you're a little overwhelmed with everything going on around you and you just shoot something really wide, and, but there's nothing, you don't know where your eye should go. Mm -hmm. Like your yeah. well, like your protest picture with the the girl. There's clearly one person that you're focused on in that protest, laying on the ground, and hundreds of people behind them. 
but it wasn't just one blanket shot of all the people on the street. That's a great, that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, totally. I, in this one, my eye goes to the guy's hand for some reason. Mm -hmm. I think it usually goes to people's faces if you can get a face. Um, this was another thing, a protest. It's not really a protest. They were celebrating at this point. The protest was over. Mm -hmm. And I think the focal point of it, you, and again, I guess there's a crowd here, but the focal point is that joyous lady dancing. <laughs> um, and I just, uh, I don't know, it was great to be around for, for some of that stuff that felt really big. Um, there's, not, there's one I took of some turkeys right before they got um, turned into turkey dinner. It was about as far as we would probably go in the newspaper. <laughs> I like it. Focal point is the guy is faced the turkey, but if you look a little closer, you can see blood running down his his um his uh his uh, rubber pants yeah. uh, but you know they just let me hang around and i could shoot what i wanted to shoot this is a great one by you i think there's a moment going on here there's like uh, interaction between two two people and you got a flag in there which is a really powerful thing to have in a photograph um and the red the, the red what this was for memorial day is that right this was yes hmm. yes it was memorial day kids out a uh, fourth grade class went out to uh put flags on veterans yeah and you could to, you could totally do this with your own family um then there's spot news which we used to do a lot of but we almost never do anymore um we don't we don't get much we don't shoot many fires or accidents these days that's mm -hmm. they may in other newspapers or other big cities but it's not a big deal for us anymore but you can always have a camera with you you can always Always get it. Could be your own emergency. Could be your house flooding when your washing machine overflows, or when you want to sit on the side of the road and you get a call. Triple A. You could document that too if you wanted to. Um, I think the spot news that we cover now has got to be something a little bit extraordinary, uh, it bigger does. than it the does. Yeah, it like does. the seventy car pileups on ninety five, and <laughs> yes. that happened uh, two winters ago, or you know stuff like that. We go to, of course, a little bigger, right? And uh, shoot sports, a lot of sports. And Linda brought it up earlier that there's sports action, but there's also sports reaction, which could be just as interesting or um, maybe more interesting. I think we've seen all the sports action photos um, in our lifetimes already, maybe. And maybe it's the reactions that are the new ones that we haven't seen. I don't know. Um, so this is a reaction. Um, I like shooting these when people win the gold ball and they turn to bring it over to their fans. There's always some great photos there. Um, but there's also, I don't know, there's basketball photos. And you don't need to have anything technical to shoot these. You just have to be down under the hoop. And I like, I like faces. These are sort of the same photo, but. <laughs> and uh, we used to, I don't know if we'll shoot the tournament this coming year or not. I hope so. I know. I hope so, too. And then there's features. Uh, uh, features are the kind of photos we just sort of happen we run into and you can run into these all day yourself too they're just beautiful slices of life they don't necessarily go with a story um, but you just got to have your eyes open and your camera with you think uh, kids sledding a woman walking her dog at sunset old men playing chess in the park city worker changing a light bulb at the top of a pole or a dog peeing on a sign <laughs> I love that that's, that's my old dog that's my old dog. <laughs> <laughs> yep uh, um, I love it because it makes me laugh. Yeah, I, I guess I got some animal photos in here. I shot this looking down from a bridge one day. Their alewives were in. I just happened to be walking across the bridge and noticed a bunch of birds down there eating fish. Um, same with that one. Mm -hmm. um, and here's one that you took recently. Uh, now, I'll tell you why I love this photo. It's like, yeah, I've seen horses before. I love the dog. And I like how you've included a lot of sky. To me, that says Arista County or something. And I love the little dog running on the side. I think that makes it a great, great photo. Thanks. I don't know. Sky goes with farming for some reason, like big open space, right? And you've got the guy, he's tack sharp, his great sunglasses. If he didn't have sunglasses on, it wouldn't be such a great photo. But you can really, he's like twinkling at you there. You, you know, that's great. I love that photo. I hope, oh, it wins, hope it wins a contest this year. And oh, this is me shooting in some snow. We got to get on to the, uh, we're almost done to this part. Uh, you took this recently too. And I think this was a feature. You were not on a softball assignment, right? No, actually, this is funny, Troy. I just put this in the other day. It was from a game that I shot, uh, I don't know, a month ago. And I pulled this one and set it aside because I liked it. And I just, all I did was put it in for when they, you know how they're talking about about games are coming up and we always need some kind oh. of a file photo. <laughs> oh, that's what it is. I, just, I loved it. I like the light and stuff. So I'm like, I'll just put it in. That just it has set, not published yet. 
No, it's just, it's so beautiful. It just says summer. It's like, oh, I just, I want to be there. And I, like, you can hear the, the clang of the aluminum bat and um, you can like taste the dust and great. Wonderful photo, Linda. I'm so lucky to get to work with you. <laughs> and I mean that, <laughs> but it sounds strange. Well, if you will, we got to answer this question. I took this at sunrise. Um, that's a lady jogging. Um, so anyway, uh, before we run out of time, we had a photo contest. Uh, people uh, sent in um, um, their best shots. We had about 60 people uh, send in stuff. And uh, I picked uh, this afternoon uh, without Linda. Uh, we weren't in contact at that one. The three winners. Here, here are the three winners. And uh, these were very good. And just keep in mind that everybody's photo that got sent in was truly nice. They were good photos. And um, what I say about your photo doesn't mean anything because everybody's got a photo in a shoebox or on their phone that means something to them emotionally and personally that may not be like a technically great photo. So uh, that's another great thing about photography. So these are just the ones that I think uh, to tell little stories the best about Maine. I love this photo for this is like number three. This is um, this is Tom Hale's photo. I don't know what's going on here because we don't have a cut line to go with it. But yeah, it's like going to prom or something. That's going to the prom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> love this photo because yeah. that that ah. kid is so happy. He borrowed that car, he rented that tux, and he got that beautiful girl to go with him. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cute. This is the best night of his life so far. And I like the little detail of the Dale Earnhardt sticker down in the, wi in the window, too. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's just, uh -huh. I love this. And it looks like it was probably taken out this, the passenger window of another car, which to me, that, that's a great get, a, a nice grab. Nice mm -hmm. grab, as we say. Uh, number two is this photo here, which at first looks like this is Tom uh, Grogan's photo, and at first it looks like a you know a, a decent uh, scenic photo of a main harbor, but what I think makes it a great little news photo is the two fishermen walking up the mud down on the oh, lower yeah. and the left. I love that. They, you see, one of them's got a playmate cooler. I mean, does that not scream Maine fishermen? A playmate cooler, rubber boots, walking up yeah. the mud. The t tide is out. They couldn't get their dory or their skiff all the way back to the uh, all the way back to the dock great colors in this too and the the one the one that i picked as the winner is this one by kate cutco and i like this photo because it's got like a, a round robin of, of great little stories going on here there's a kid you think oh kid reading a book and he's got a mask on so we know basically when that was but then you see the sign and it says free books, Bodenham Public Library, and what looks to be like a mobile bookmobile behind there. And there's another kid browsing. Yeah. And then over on the upper right hand corner, there's somebody with their with a great stance in their legs. And it looks like they've got a bunch of green sticking out of a bag. So it must be a farmer's market. And I just love all that stuff together. Uh, there's a lot in that uh, one. Yeah. And it, it even looks like the kid is reading a book about um, growing something, it looks like. <laughs> So anyway, uh, thank you for sending those in. The winners will be in the, on the website tomorrow. We got a little story that's gonna, gonna run with that. Um, for questions, we did have one emailed to us earlier um, before we get to the ones that were written down recently. This is what advice do you have uh, for making the best use of auto settings to speed up the picture taking process? Are there any auto settings that can be trusted, i.e. be a good partner for a seasoned manual shooter? I have a lot of experience taking pictures and only shoot in manual mode. I have low vision, so this can be a slow process for me. I've never trusted any auto settings except focus, which I have to rely on because I can't see through the viewfinder well enough to focus. Oh. That comes from a guy named Tom. And wow. I would say I'm in the same boat, Tom. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out that there was nothing wrong with my camera. It's just that I needed glasses. <laughs> so <laughs> I rely on autofocus all the time. And I don't know about you, Linda, but I, I have always, since day one for whatever reason shot what they call aperture priority or i i that's I, what I'm i sorry. use yep that's I'm, what i use I, actually I, I either use that or shutter priority where i either pick the shutter speed or the aperture depending on what effect i'm looking for and then the camera sets the other end of that automatically and so uh, especially cameras now i think they can be totally trusted unless there's a strange situation of backlighting or something and even when yeah. you're shooting manually you're, you're relying on the meter because yep. you don't and so yeah yeah, I, I, today's cameras, I mean, I don't know. Uh, they make me look a lot better. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and get to some some interaction. For yeah, that's actually where you just uh, kind of your comment back from that question that um, that came in earlier. There were a couple of people in the chat that were asking about the equipment that you guys use. Um, 
for digital photos to print well, what do they, what do you need for resolution? Um, and then just in general, um, what cameras do you suggest um, beginner and affordable, you know, for, for professional cameras, things of that nature? I would go out on a limb and say, there's no, there are no bad cameras. Nobody's manufacturing anything. It's not going to do you well. I try to avoid this sort of question because I, I want to stress that it's not the camera, it's you. And so it, for, for instance, I use Canon equipment and Linda uses Nikon. And somehow we get along, although we don't borrow each other's lenses. <laughs> um, any, I don't know, I don't even know what the current models are, but anything that you pay, uh, you know, you get what you pay for, I guess, but your phone is fine for the most part. But um, any Canon Rebel camera that you get, um, anything uh, from, from, I don't know if you can see, I have this big, I have this old camera here, this view camera. And this is the, the 35 millimeter camera that I started photographing with the high school yearbook. And then my phone, um, they're all the same. They're all a box with a hole at one end and something light sensitive at the other end. And everything else is a little bit of like, I don't know, window dressing. Am I doing that right, Linda? What, what do you see? You may have a totally different opinion. think she may be frozen <laughs> you may be frozen yeah well so yeah um, resolution i don't know you need um my camera is i don't think it's any more than 16 megapixels which is fine for a picture like this and we print on online online it's incredibly low resolution really um so you don't need to spend a million bucks if you spent 1200 dollars on a camera and a lens combo like a dslr you're fine uh, the camera I use is a Canon 5D Mark III, which is like two models ago, and uh, I, I don't I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about the equipment, I guess, which is easy for me to say. But I don't. <laughs> so there are a couple <laughs> questions about storage and organization and kind of editing. Mm. Through. People would like to have some suggestions on, you know, how do you eliminate images and like choose the ones that you want to keep and then because you have all of these photos that you're taking constantly because you know the, the rule is don't take your finger off the shutter yeah. <laughs> what do you do for storage what are your I, you know how do you keep it's organized um it's a struggle um uh, because i shoot i, I bet on a, i spent i shoot like a thousand frames a week easy um but i'm merciless i don't I don't keep anything more than a couple of days if I'm not going to use it. If, if I shoot something and it's a very, if it's like 17 variations on a, a few seconds, I can usually pretty easily spot the one I'm going to use. And then I, I erase the rest by the end of the week because I don't have the storage for that many photos, especially really, uh, really huge ones. Um, so I use, I use Adobe Lightroom. Um, to organize my photos because um, it allows you to put keywords on them because if you don't put keywords on them or a caption or, or something like that you'll never find them again you have to put names on them and dates and places so that you can do searches because we have a big uh, organizing system for the bdn called merlin and it's got thousands and thousands and thousands of photos but if you don't put a, a keyword on it or tag it in some way with a date or a name or something it's as good as not saving it because you'll never find it again when you need it Linda, are they, can you hear us, Linda? I think she's still having some technical no. difficulties, unfortunately. Um, John, John wants to know, he says, my understanding is that when people are in public places, there is no legal right to privacy. Would you talk about handling private privacy concerns um, yeah. as professionals and amateurs? Yeah, you have the same rights as an amateur as I do as a professional. We, we have the same rights is that you can take a picture of anybody in a public place legally uh, where they have no reasonable expectation of privacy. That means in a park, on a sidewalk, even in their front yard, really. Um, if you were using some strange, long 1200 millimeter lens with an infrared sight on it, and you were shooting through their bedroom window at night, then you'd be in trouble. But if they're out in public and they're doing anything in public, you have a 100% right uh, to take the photo um, as long as you're on public property. You can see them from public property somewhere. That being said, uh, you have to use your news judgment on whether it's worth the, 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 the fighting. It was like, like the girl who was crying with the cow, right? I was in a public place, I was at the fair, I shot the photo. If she, if I had gone up to her and gotten her to try to get her name and she said, oh gosh, please don't do that. You're gonna kill me, please don't, I wouldn't have. 
So if it's a politician who I shot a picture of crying and they ran up to me and said, please don't publish that, I would say, sorry, because you're a public figure. There's a little bit of a you know, sort of what, what the news value is, I guess. But legally speaking, uh, anywhere in public is, is go. You, anywhere you could sketch somebody, you can take a picture. Great. And to just wrap this up, there's, there's two questions here um, that maybe we can roll into one. But um, someone asked, um, do you think differently when trying to tell a story with a landscape photo? photo? Because, you know, we'd asked for photos, the photo submissions we'd asked for was for Ma of Maine and Mainers. So how are you thinking differently when you're trying to take a landscape photo? And then kind of a little side, like side note of that, just to recap tonight, um, for for the average folk, <laughs> explain yep. like how what's the what are the three tips to explain why like how to take a, a storytelling photo like what are those three top tips you know mm -hmm. that you can give? Sure. Well, uh, I don't take landscape photos that don't have people in them, because as my very wise newspaper advisor in college told me once, um, people buy newspapers, mountains don't. So I always have a human being in there in a face. So if it's a pretty, pretty sunset, I wait until at least a boat is moving through it or somebody jogging, or I look for fishermen in a pretty sunset. Or if it's a field of lupins, I at least try to shoot a bee buzzing around the lupin or something like that. Um, but all, I think Ansel Adams said something about um, even in landscape photography, there is a decisive moment when the, uh, when the light is just right or, or when the cloud moves in, in the right spot to tell you know, the feeling or the mood you're, you're trying to get. In terms of the three big ones, I would say uh, action. Uh, I would also say uh, action. And third would be action. Uh, and be being brave about the action is uh, if you, uh, if you uh, have to shoot somebody in a, in a, uh, for a, a portrait and you got some folks lined up around the Christmas tree and you say one, two and you're going to get to three start shooting on one and then keep shooting after you get to like five because something before that will happen or something after that will happen that'll be much better uh, um, i if i shoot a, a big, big group thing and i stand on a chair to look down a little bit i sometimes pretend like i'm losing my balance to, to and then they'll stop thinking about themselves for a second um anything you can get them moving or out of the ordinary um is the is really the heart of photojournalism and just being clear is that, is that an answer? Uh, no, that's great. Uh, <laughs> that's a, yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it's like you had said earlier, it's about keeping your eye in the camera and on, you know, what's happening um, and, you know, being ready to shoot almost at any moment, <laughs> any given moment to get that. Uh, you're, you're better at summing this up than I am. That's great. <laughs> get that perfect picture that you're, you know, you don't know that is a perfect picture until after the fact. Um, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, one last question. What is your start or go-to lens? I've taken the majority of every photo for the past 25 years with just two lenses. I shoot with a with two zoom lenses, a 24 to this is based on the full frame. It's a 24 to 70, which is pretty wide to a little bit telephoto. So a 24 to 70, and the other one is a 70 to 200, which is a little bit telephoto to a little bit more telephoto. It's neither the both of them. It, it starts out a little wider than your field of vision and ends up a little narrow than your field of vision. Anything fisheye and wide looks weird and it just calls attention to the fact that you used a fisheye lens and anything like super telephoto does the same thing. So if you want it to look normal, it's it's two lenses. If I had to pick one, it would be a, I would get a 35 millimeter lens, but Great. it's usually 20, 24 to 70 and 70 to 200. So I have a camera on each arm. Got it. Uh, Linda, are you with us again? Uh... Unfortunately, I think Linda's having some, again, oh. difficulties, which is too bad. But, well, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you, Troy and Linda. I'm sorry you can't hear us, Linda. But thank you for the wonderful presentation and all the insight and the beautiful pictures that we got to see. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we had we did, we did record this event, so uh, you will be getting um, an email with a link to the recording um, at some point next week. Um, we will also share a link to the article for the winner photos that were published and any other resources that um, Troy and Linda might have um, that they want to share with you as well. Linda, are you back? Can you hear us? Oh, okay. <laughs> she keeps breathing. Um, Thank you so much, Linda. I, I know how hard it is to struggle with technical stuff. Thanks for being here. It really, it really meant a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, we do have another event coming up on August 
10th. It is the first five years of Maine's nas uh, newest national monument and what's next. It's gonna be a discussion about the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. Um, that's again, August 10th at 6 p.m. I hope you can join us. You can find the information on um, the Bangor Daily News. I, almost, I, just, I, can't back. I come back, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Looney's. We can hear you. We're just wrapping up. Did you have some final <laughs> words or thoughts that you wanted to say, Linda? Sorry, what? I'm sorry, it was on again. We're wrapping. Did you have any final thoughts or words you wanted to say before we wrap up here? No. Oh. I'm sorry, Linda, we can't hear you. Well, we're going to let everybody go because we're running a little bit over here. But uh, yep, thank did you say? <laughs> thank you both again so, so much. And thank you, everybody for joining us. Uh, please feel free to send in any questions or comments you might have to events at the Bang at bangordailynews.com and we will see you the next time around. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you.